Привет. Uh, no, я немного говорит по-русски, so I have no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> I hope that it wasn't nothing about me. So, uh, so let's talk about Lean then. Um, in 1930s, uh, there was a decision made to build in this very city center of uh, New York, in Manhattan, the tallest building, that was the tallest building till the 1970s. So, some of you maybe recognize this building. Empire State Building, yep. So, they built a huge building, and it's uh, over 100 floors, over 400 meters if you include the antenna, just like 380 if you don't include the antenna. Uh, very city center, so you know, you don't have a football field next to it where you can just storage all the stuff inside. Uh, you just have a, you know, small land and you're supposed to get everything in there and put a huge building inside. And it was the biggest building, so they were not quite sure how to build it. So there were different problems they were trying to solve. So the question is, how long it took them to build this building? What do you guys think? Well, one, year. one year. You did any renovation in your home recently? <laughs> so what do you guys think? Is it one year? Ten years, maybe, yeah, if you think about how, how good we are in the at the construction. Anyone from the Ukraine here? Or we have just some local people? Oh, we get one, two, all right, yeah. So, uh, we, we, we had a Euro 2012 with Poland and the Ukraine, and we are supposed to get a highway from Krakow to, uh, to Kiev, and they just finished this in uh, 2016. So, yeah, this is how, how good we are in, 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 in building some stuff. And yeah, by the way, this building was done in 410 days. So they built it in just a bit above one year. How they did it? Well, they did a few things differently than what we usually do when we're building uh, houses, we're building our highways. So first of all, there was a strong cooperation between the owner and the architects and the, and the uh, construction company. They knew their constraints and they focused on the constraint. One of the constraints is that they want to have a tallest building. The second constraint is, oh, we have just two acres of land. Next constraint is, we want to open on the May 1st, because if you don't open on the May 1st in New York, that time, then you need to wait another year, because no one is going to uh, lend area from you, or rent the, the, the place from you, till the next first of May. So basically they know the constraint and they try to limit the dependencies between all parts of the construction. So for example, the steel construction was kind of independent. The schedule for the steel construction was kind of independent from the concrete, which was kind of independent from the interior, which was independent from the exterior. They also knew that any small delay can be a huge problem for them. And they knew how big pr they monetize, how big the problem can be. So they say any delay that is for one day costing less than $10,000, which is like 120000 right now. So any delay for one day causing less than 10000 you just go ahead. You just spend the money. You have approval for that. So anything that you can speed up, just do it. Uh, they also create their teams differently. So you most likely remember this picture. So the guys were created in the teams. And they work it as a team, which means basically, if any one of you is injured, then the group is disbanded. So they have to take care of each of them. And it was one of the safest construction at that time. Two people died totally. One was uh, one of the constructors, the second was a pedestrian that was hit into the leg and died of the gangrena. So you know guys, with all the security we have here, all the safety nets, no. Uh, still just two people because they were taking care of themselves, right? So they have a goal for the team, not for individual worker. Uh, they had a very tight schedule of incoming materials. So there were like 500 trucks coming every day for the construction site because there was no space, pl space to take all these materials. Those metal beams, they were created in 
Pittsburgh, which is like 300 miles away from the, from the place. And the schedule was created that well that those beams came to the construction site still warmer. So you can still feel the warmth of the, uh, of the beams coming from, from, coming from the 300 miles away. Uh, so one thing that I want you to show is that the fact that someone can do it doesn't mean that we are still doing the same way the uh, buildings not right now. The other thing is, by the way, if you didn't know this, they didn't have Microsoft Project that time. So they manage this without any software. That's amazing, isn't it? Um, let me give you another example. Anyone recognize the airplane? It's a Boeing 737. Uh, they're creating those planes. They're assembling those planes in the US. There, so there's a huge factory in the US. They're assembling those planes. Um, so basically, you just have a plane body, and you have like three and a half hundred of thousand parts to put inside, the same amount of bolts, uh, and like 60 kilometers of the wire. How much do you guys think it's take them to assemble one plane? Couple of years. 11 days. And this is the data I have from 2005, so I couldn't find the, the newest data. 11 days. How well, yeah, how do you feel about flying right now, yeah? So they change the way they're, they're running the factory. So before they had just the planes around the factory and they were working on them. Right now they have the production line. The planes move two inches every minute. So they slowly move to the factory. What are the consequences? Any problem we have, we need to fix immediately. So any issue we find out, any blocker we have, we're just going to say, OK, we're going to solve this problem later on because the plane is moving. So we need to stop the line, which means basically we need to stop all the planes. So any problem that is coming up means that we need to be fixed immediately. And we need to make sure that the problem is not going to reappear again. Well, we can take a few observations coming from the from those two examples. Uh, and the very first one I already mentioned, the fact that someone did something doesn't mean that we're going to repeat this one. So the fact that someone is effective on something doesn't mean that we're going to be effective as well. Moreover, the fact that we've been effective in one project, for example, in one organization, in one part of our system or, or a company, doesn't mean that we will be effective everywhere else. There is no correlation between those two facts. Uh, the second scary fact coming from this is the fact that you don't know how to do it, so how to go faster, doesn't mean that, you, that the you know, other doesn't know it. So it doesn't mean that uh, it's not possible. And the last but not least, and this is the most scary one, the fact that you don't know how to go fast, you don't know how to do it, doesn't mean that your competition doesn't know how to do it. So it's up to you if you're going to survive. But it's also to remember for you guys that your competitors always can find a better way of working, a faster way of working. And speaking of faster way of working, what uh, Bank did in his uh, 737 factory, they copied a lot of ideas from the Toyota manufacturing system. So. Toyota, after the Second World War, oh, I know this. So you have, we have uh, 44 hours uh, on this on this line. That that is why I was surprised. It's just one one second is left. Uh, that's pretty cool. So yeah, let's let's see how I'm doing with the time. Okay, uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, so what Toyota did after the Second World War, they wanted to compete on the car manufacturing market. But you know. The Japan was basically destroyed after the Second World War because there was no uh, economy at all. So it was very hard uh, for Toyota to copy the ideas from the Ford, for example, because the Ford was focusing on uh, mass production. The more we produce, the lower cost we have, uh, the lower price we can sell the car. But 
Ford was producing like 9,000 of cars per month, Toyota were able to produce 900 cars. So it's one tenth of the, what, what, what Ford what could do. So basically they couldn't afford for getting as much inventory as the, to, as the Ford could do, and they couldn't afford for having so expensive system as Ford could do. So they say, okay, what we can do differently, how we can approach this system differently so we can produce high quality car. By the way, in the 1950s when they were trying to change the system, uh, the most crappy car you can get is was Toyota or any, any Japan car. So they said, okay, let's see if the customer can come, us, come to us, give us a cash, we run with this cash to buy all the parts and then deliver to him the car as fast as we can. So we buy the parts using his cash, so we don't have all the parts of the, of the parts, we just get them right in time the moment he won the car. So one of the creators of the Toyota production system, Tachiono said, we're looking at the time between the order and the moment we get the cash, and we're trying to get rid of all the waste we have in the system. So to shrink this time as much as we can. So Toyota was focusing and still is focusing on finding what is the waste in the system and how we can remove it. And Tachi Ono was very well known as a teacher for understanding this system. So what he did, was doing, for example, he was taking one of his engineers, putting him next to the production line, taking a, taking a, a marker, drawing a circle, we call this Ono circle right now, put the engineer inside and say, watch. And he went off. And four hours later, he came back. What do you see? Well, the parts are moving here, and then they go there, and so on, and so on. OK, bye. See ya. And coming back again uh, four hours later, so you know, the guy is standing basically in this circle for eight hours. What do you see? Well, when I see that we are transporting the parts from this place to that place, so if we move those two machines closer to each other, we could save on transporting. And basic, basically, this guy is uh, left-handed, but he has all the parts on her right side. So if we move the box with the parts on the left side, he don't do so much moves. And that way, they learn how to remove the waste. So Tachi Ono, to help people removing the waste, he defines seven types of waste. We're going to talk about them soon. And later on, when we've been, when we've been uh, discussing what kind of waste we have, especially for knowledge management, because again, we're not going to remove the typical waste of the production, we're going to remove the waste of the knowledge creation. So we came up with three new uh, type, types of waste. I'm gonna show them to you now. But before we get there, my request is for you guys just to stop for one minute and think about, okay, in our current system, what kind of waste we have. So if you have any notepad, then it's going to be useful. If not, then just grab a phone and you can put it on some, no some notes or some email, whatever. Just for one minute, have a thought about, so you wake up, uh, you can show it to the person next to you so, so you can see what kind of waste he has in his system. So think about, okay, what waste we have in our system. All right, it's time for you guys to think about your system, your production, your software development, how do we waste time in our production? Okay, one minute for you guys. Right now. And I grab some water. That's tricky. Okay, we get it? Um, so I'm gonna take you from the, through the seven ways uh, from Toyota. And again, you remember that the seven ways we're creating for production, 
So we cannot just copy them to software development. We need to think about, OK, how do they relate to the software development? So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the uh, production, but we, we're going to also to connect this knowledge with, with what we know about the software development. So the very first one is inventory. So if you go to your uh, accounting department and ask them, OK, we have both so many staff. We have so much inventory. How do you feel about it? And I say, yeah, that's the money we have in the organization. That's great, because we have some inventory. From Toyota perspective, it's a waste. Any inventory you have in the system, it's a frozen money. It can decay. So you know it can rust. It can be destroyed over the time. You need to store it. And there is a huge chance that we change the design, and you need to throw it away. So basically, Having any inventory in the, the system is a waste from the Toyota perspective. Uh, extreme examples of having an inventory, too much inventory, was one factory that was supposed to do the design for the uh, mirror for the Ford. So there was a new Ford coming to the market in the US, and they were supposed to do the design. So they get the, uh, they get the car from Ford. It's, you know, it's a new model, so it's not on the market, so it's kind of uh, secret one already. So they get the, they get the new Ford to, to try the new, new mirrors, and the Ford is stolen. The car is not there. So they call the police because it's a you know, secret car, someone stole it, it's a huge problem. And they find the car three months later. Basically, it was in the factory, in the middle of the factory, they just put inventory us out, you know, around the curve, so they couldn't find the curve for three months. It's a real case scenario, so, you know. We have a huge inventory in product development, but in product development, in car manufacturing, you can see the inventory, or you cannot see the car because of inventory. In software development, it's not so clear, it's not so easy to see our in-process inventory. What is our in-process inventory, by the way? What? I'm sorry? Uh, maybe the task, I don't know. Yeah, the task. Sorry, yeah. I'm not going to do the iteration. Okay. Documentation, okay. Documentation. All right, so basically anything that you started but have not finished is your in-process inventory. So you wrote the requirement specification, but you haven't delivered this one, right? So we spend, you know, three months talking with the customer to create the perfect requirements, and we haven't delivered. That's an inventory. You don't see it because it doesn't pile in entrance to your company, but it's still there. You wasted time for in-process inventory. You wrote the specification. Now you did the design, but you haven't implemented it yet. Or you implemented it yet, but it's not yet compiling. Or maybe it's compiling, but we haven't tested it yet. Or we test it, but it's not on the production. Anything that is not on the production is inventory, and it's a waste from the Toyota perspective. That's a huge difference because mostly we are happy that people are busy in our organization, right? Everyone is busy. We're creating a lot of documentation. We are so effective in creating the documentation. From Toyota perspective, anything you have not delivered to the production, it's a waste. So, for example, in Scrum or in Canva, we're trying to reduce working progress, right? So we're trying to just focus on few requirements at the same time deliver them to the whole system to go to the production. Being on the test environment is not on the production, by the way. So being on the production is when you're done with the in-process inventory. That's the first one. Second one. Overproduction. Creating the cars no one wants to buy. Again, most of the most of the cases, if you ask someone, oh, we have so much cars ready waiting on the parking lot, it's a, it's a huge investment, right? Well, it's a waste for the Toyota. If you're creating something no one is going to buy from you, that's a waste. In software development, what is, what is overproduction? Features, yeah. So features no one is going to use. And I don't know if you've seen this data before, but in 2002, in, uh, on, the, on the conference in Italy, uh, 
the guys show the research data, when the 64% of the feature are never or very rarely being used. And it's over and over again. I'm going to the customer, asking him, how, how are you doing? I'm showing this the data, and they're saying, okay, we have kind of similar situation. We have nine products, three of them are being used, six of them not being used. We develop all of them. Mary Poppendix, uh, she's a famo famous lady who brings Lean into the software development. She go to the customer, to one of the bank, and show the data, and she said, okay, 64% in this data of features are never being, or rarely being used. And the, and the owner, the, the CEO of the bank said, what are idiots? How possibly they can do it? And Mary said, oh, we did some research in this bank before, and we have a better data. Only 62% of your features are not being used or very rarely being used. So this, this is a team we have in software development. We're pretty good at creating the feature no one is going to use. And they slow us down, right? The thing is that we have those features, but we cannot add new features as fast as we, as we could. Because we need to keep them, maintain them. We have more code. We have more complexity in the system. That's make our life more difficult. Next one is doing any processing that is not necessary by the for the customer. Again, example, example from, the, uh, from the Toyota manufacturing. There was uh, one division putting, the, putting the, uh, uh, a, a, a layer on the metal, on the metal form. So, so they're putting it like kind, kind of paint or something like that. Uh, and there was another one who was using this part. And the guys are basically brushing this, this, uh, this paint from, from, from this metal. Uh, and, and, and the consultant asked them, why are you doing this one? Oh, because this is too thick. I mean, there's too much paint on that, so we need to remove it so it's work, work okay. So they're coming back to the first department asking them, guys, you're putting the paint on this one. Yes, we do. And you're putting too much paint on this. Yes, that's on purpose. Why that's on purpose? Have you seen how they brush this? So they remove all the paint? So we need to put more paint on that. So, so and you know what? Basically, we're paying for that. So we're paying for putting too much paint, and we're paying for removing this paint later on. So we get a removing of the, remove, removing of the unnecessary necessary processes. What kind of unnecessary processes we have in software development. <laughs> that almost killed me. I'm sorry? Changing requirements. Changing requirements um, I would say that the requirements could be uh, in process inventory if you invest a lot of time and then you change the requirements. That would be in process inventory rather. Uh, that could be, for example, writing the documentation no one is reading, right? That's an amazing way of wasting our time. We have a plenty of documentation we need to write, right? The other thing is that we have spent some time to get some knowledge, and we forget it, and we need to relearn this knowledge. So imagine that we have a two situation. Now, I'm writing a code, a tester is next to me, he did the testing, show me the bug, I fix it the bug five minutes. Now we're using a formal process for communicating the bug. So I write the code. A week later, the tester is testing. He find a bug. He put it into, the, into our favorite tool. A week later, I see the bug, and I need to work on this one. So I need to open the code, look at the code. I don't recall writing this code anymore. So I need to relearn this code and, uh, again. I need to understand what I was thinking about. So it's also taking me a time to understand what I was doing. So this is one of the ways we have much in software development. We are trying to relearn because we find a bug in something we have wrote two weeks ago. Instead, I find a bug something I wrote five minutes ago. That's a huge in production, a transportation, which means basically, okay, we take some stuff from one place and put it into the magazine. And we take from the magazine, we put it back to the production, and so on. We, so we move all the parts through the system. And basically, from the customer perspective, they are not really willing to pay for the fuel of moving the stuff. But it's not so easy to 
copy this concept to software development, right? Because, you know, moving developers is not such a huge problem. So what are we transporting in software development? Deployment, releases, I, knowledge, I think. I think that the, the releases or deployment is kind of activity, right? Doing, the, uh, doing something. But knowledge is something we transfer. Where do we transfer it from? Yeah. So, so basically, we take from one head and put it to another head. This is how we transfer the knowledge, right? So, any knowledge transfer in the context of that was on purpose. Uh, and acknowledge transfer that is handoffs. So we get the one department writing down the requirements, and we have another one doing the architecture, and another one doing the development, and another one doing the testing, right? And we transfer the knowledge. By the way, how do we transfer usually the knowledge? Tr through the documentation, and it just sucks, right? We know that already. So the way we address this problem is we try to create a cell with different skills, different specialities, right? And we're trying to have the, all the knowledge into the cell. So we call this Scrum Team. So we don't transfer the knowledge because the handoffs are very ineffective wave. And the handoffs through the documentation is extremely way ineffective wave of transferring the knowledge. Motion. I already mentioned this one. So you can see that. If a guy is making too much motions, basically it's a waste for the customer. So in Toyota, for example, when the, when the car is coming on the line, production line, they have a green line when they are supposed to stand when the car is coming, and they have a yellow line when they're supposed to finish their work. And the guy say, okay, but I have a green line here, and I can go here and start you know, uh, doing more work earlier, so why I should wait on the green? Line. And they say, because you're going to do more movement, and it's going to take you more time if you start from here and finish here, than if you start from the green line and finish on the yellow line. So it's going to be faster for you that you wait for the car instead of moving one, 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 one step aside. Okay, how does it relate to software development? You have a hint on the picture, by the way. Again, it can be it can be uh, it can be challenging because we talk about the knowledge transfer, which is critical. So we want to involve people earlier so they have a knowledge. But well. If we, if we go with the waterfall approach, but now we have a hands-off, right? So we want to involve people earlier, so they, they are the tester from the very beginning, for example, understand how, what he's going to test, right? So maybe he's not testing the requirements, requirements analysis, but having a tester at the very beginning of your project can save a lot of money. Just to give you an example, uh, which one? I have a few of them. Um, Oh, I, I like this one. Okay, so there was a police radio to be to be created, and the tester were not involved into the into the requirement specification <laughs> section, by the way, and they get the finally they get the requirements and the testing, and one of the tests says um, the policeman should be able to use the radio even if he's being shot, and the very first thought that the tester has is how I'm going to test it. Are they going to give us the gun so we can shoot our own policeman, or are they going to give us the policeman who is already shot, right? So you want to have a tester in advance. But in our case, it's more like a multitasking. So we're trying to run five projects at the same time. The best scenario I've seen, 60 people, 80 projects the same time. So it's a huge multitasking. And they say, oh, we're trying to be uh, agile. We're trying to be effective. No, you are not. You're spending a lot of time just wasting it trying to do everything. And so we have a huge work in progress because we have 80 projects. So we have a huge inventory. We are completely ineffective and we spend most of the time wasting this time just to switch the context. Because we need to take the whole one project out of our mind 
and put another the second one. So basically, if you're trying to work on two projects, then you're like 50% effective. If you're trying to work on free or fraud, then basically you are not effective at all. You just have one soul on your project, right? Someone who is coming for the stand-ups, saying, hi, I'm, good, I'm done, I need to go, right? So just don't. That's why we want in Scrum, for example, we want to have people to be 100% allocated for the software development project, one project. And the second side is that most of the organization do the multitasking because they don't know how to prioritize. So instead of prioritizing, they say everything is important, and let's go ahead. We have four projects in the same time. And asking which one is important? Oh, this one is important. But this one is also important. And we need to do those two things because we promised them. Oh, don't forget about this one and that one and this, right? So we're having this all the time. So just stop multitasking. One item at a time, finish it, go to the next item. This is one thing we love in software development. We're waiting. What are we waiting for usually? Resources, testers, uh, um, well, resources in the context of the testing systems, testers in the context of people. What else? Feedback. What kind of feedback? From customer. From customer. Oh, yeah. Have you seen the, 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 the software we have put on the beta two weeks ago? Oh, not yet, right? So we're waiting for this one. Anything else we're waiting for? Oh, decision. That's lovely, right? So can you make a decision because the team has no right to make a decision? Any kind of decision? The favorite one case for me is that there was an organization and they had to ask for uh, approval for any order they are doing, even if it's just like a keyboard for 10, for 10 euro, right? So they still had to have the approval for this one. And my personal opinion is that the salary of the guy who was doing the approval was higher during the five minutes of approval, he earned more than the 10 euro that he was approving for. So that was kind of amazing in this organization that they went so high with approval. So we're waiting for any decision. We're just waiting. And if you analyze the project you have, whoops, uh, if you analyze the project you have, if you analyze how fast you are, you find out that you spend most time waiting for someone, for something, for some decision, or maybe because we're multitasking, maybe we're working on five features at the same time, and you find out that if you just focus on this particular area, you could deliver this feature like 25%, maybe 50% of the normal time. We did this kind of exercise for a big bug, where we ran a Scrum project, a pilot for, for them, for one of the specific projects they had. And we did the analysis, how much would it take for us to run the same project using their normal approach, the waterfall approach. And we find out that we were able to deliver something in one month, it would take them four months to deliver. And I think this was kind of optimistic version. Oh, the beer is coming. Oh, that's the water. <laughs> Crap. Set the expectation at the beginning of the, tr of, of, of the presentation, right? Um, next one. Defects. Oh, we love them, right? And they slow us down, right? Because we need to relearn, especially when we find them later on. So we wait to get the feedback, right? So if the, the time between you wrote the code and get the feedback is long, then you forget and you need to relearn. So defects are giving us a lot of different other problems. So just make sure you don't have a defects in the system, right? So just make sure that there are none of them. Okay, let's speed up a little bit. Um, we came to the seven by now. So these are the seven created by, uh, by Tachi Ono. Now we're coming to three more that are kind of important to mention. Uh, very first one is uh, wishful thinking. That's kind of amazing. That's part of the project management we have. There are going to be two talks on the project management, so I need to mention that the wishful thinking is a for, it should be a formal part of the project management. I wish you can do this by Wednesday. This is wishful thinking. Oh, yes. So we have a velocity of 20 items per sprint for the last three weeks, uh, for the last three sprints, right? Can you do 30 this sprint? It's a wishful thinking, right? Well, we're going slow, but we speed up in testing. You've been in this project before? I've been to a few of them. So we, s we catch up in testing. That's a wishful thinking, right? And we have a plenty of this because we 
it's, it's for, as formal name for this one is a hope-based planning. So we hope we're going to fix it. The alternative to this approach is the data-based planning. So you get the data, you use the data versus hope-based planning. Next one. It's kind of similar to knowledge loss we mentioned before. So we get the information in the organization, but it's scattered, and we have no idea where it is. So maybe there is someone in the organization who has this knowledge, or maybe we cannot ask this person, or maybe we don't know that there's some knowledge here in the organization. So we're trying to find out who has this knowledge, we're trying to find if there is knowledge, or maybe you've been to this situation, at the end of the project, you finish and someone come in, oh, that was easy, you could just use this, you just could use this model, or you just could do this that way. Go away. Why are you telling us now? Oh, I thought you will need this knowledge, right? And the 10 one, last but not least, certainly, is when you think that the people are coming to work just by the, as a hands to work. So we don't look at the, what kind of potential they have. We don't use the potential they have in their mind. We don't try to inv invite them to how you can help making our process better, how you can help making the whole system better. Eh? That's the list. Have a look. Uh, have a look at the list you have created before. Is there any mi anything missing at your list? So is there something you can add to your list right now? And a time for the picture as well. We're done with the pictures? Oh. If anyone has a Samsung Galaxy Note 7, just don't lose it. <laughs> uh, I, I, get, I get this announcement today, uh, yesterday in the, f in, the, in the plane, so you know, guys. <laughs> it's serious. All right. One thing, one thing we need to remember, talking about the ways, one thing we need to remember that many companies are trying, are trying to reduce as many ways as they can. And instead of leaning their organization, they making a starving organization. So basically, we're creating an organization that cannot do anything because it's so lean that it just cannot react to anything that is coming from outside. So one thing we need to remember, and it's going to be a tough part for me, is that waste is just one kind of inefficiency def defined by Toyota. So we get the three types of efficiency. And Toyota called, called them, it's going to be difficult because I don't know these letters much. It's Muda. Hey, yeah, I'm writing, I'm writing Russian. I don't know Russian much. So Muda, Muda is, uh, Muda is uh, waste, right? But there are two more. It's more becoming more difficult. It's uh, more... Re, which means basically, so we have waste here. We have uh, unevenness, which basically means we have a different input. So, you know, if you load your system to 100% and there is any change at the input, how your system is going to behave. If you have a support and as your support is fully utilize, and you get a few more requirements, a few more requests from the customer how the system is going to behave. So if you assume that your system is going to run on 100 utilization, it's not going to work well, right? So an eventness is something we're trying to fix. So we're trying to have an input to the system kind of smooth. That's, how, that's why we do, for example, refinement of the requirements. So the input is kind of smoothed at the very beginning of the sprint planning. So you don't have a big items and the small items at the same time, so you're not surprised. And the last but not least, it's a mura, <laughs> uh, which is overloaded. So overloading basically is putting too much pressure on machines, on people, right? So the moment we have, you know, 100, we have a, we 
plan our system or plan our sprint for 100%, and then we have more items coming in. So for example, you have a box on production, then basically you're going to overload your people, and what's going to bring to the system? More waste, because the people are going to be tired, they're going to create the box, and you have more waste. So the things you need to remember is just not about removing the waste, but it's also about how do we make sure that the input is even, it basically means, okay, we want to have a small requirements because it's just the variation of the small requirements is smaller than on the big, var big requirements. And we make sure that the people do not work over time because it's going to at attack uh, and input more waste into the system. So remember about those two areas as well. Okay, now that's pretty cool, but Tomek, what do we do about it, right? So how I can come back Monday to our office and what I can do about it. And, and again, one thing you need to remember is that you need to do the changes at two levels. So maybe you have heard about the, I'm gonna write it in English now. Kaizen? What is Kaizen? Continuous improvement. So there's one, one idea coming from the uh, from Toyota. And there's one more, which is more difficult to write. Anyone heard about Kaikaku? What is Kaikaku? We got the expert here. It's a Japanese word. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the kind of sushi for sure. Don't order. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a systematic change. So Kaizen is something that happened at the, at the lower level. So Kaizen is a small improvement done usually at the system level, at, at the bottom level. So Kaizen is usually done by the uh, people at the production line. They see that they can improve something and they just do it. They do the change. Kaikaku is the change on the whole system level. So you just cannot go to the developers and say, okay, you guys, you're responsible for the whole system. Go ahead. Oh, you're self-organized, by the way, you go ahead. You need also to make sure that you change the whole system around them. So if you put your developers into the waterfall system and go with the Kaizen, then most likely you're not going to solve the biggest problem you have in the organization. So I'm gonna show you a few tools you can use and uh, and a specific a specific tools. I'm not gonna much talk about. I'm not gonna talk much about those items because we don't have a time now. Uh, we'll be having a good party in the afternoon or whatever. Whatever we organize the party, so I can talk. Uh, you know, during the breaks or during the party. But um, we're gonna just look at those items. So, so the very first idea is look at the value uh, stream of your system. So where do you add the value? Where you don't add the value? So the, the tool we are thinking of is called value stream mapping. And we look at the time from the very beginning, so the, you have idea to the very moment you deliver the idea to the production. And we look, when do we add value, when we just wait. So we can, you can create kind of this kind of chart, looking where is the value added. It's over the line. If you can see this is the where we add value. And below the line is when we don't add the value. So you look at when it's waiting for the, in some queues, for example, you have a backlog and the backlog is for two years. So basically, you know, we are very fast on production, except that the, back, that the item is going to wait for two years in the, in the backlog, uh, which basically show you that the queues in Toyota, from the Toyota perspective is, are bad. So any backlogs you have are bad, right? And uh, so you look at the whole system, you analyze, and then you look for the ways you can improve your system. So you create a new map, showing you how you can run your system faster, how you can improve the system. So there's one tool. Uh, next tool is we can look at the process, but we need to also look at the system around the, uh, around the process. So you can look at the dynamic of the, of the system you have ar uh, around people. So for example, if you have a performance review and you look at individual performance of each of your developers, how likely they're going to work as a team? Not much, right? But because if I'm being looked at how much do I code, I'm not going to per program with the 
junior developer because he's going to be faster and my salary is going to be lower next year. No way. I'm not going to help him solve the problem. Let he take care of this, his own problem. I have my own problem, right? So again, depending how you would create the system around those people, the people will behave according to the system. So most likely, you not, should not blame people for behave, well, how they behave because they behave the way we create the system for them. If they're yelling at each other, most likely they're being promoted or they're scary about something, about the consequences of not doing some work. So anytime, next time, next time you have a situation when you're very angry at something, someone, think about it, okay, what kind of our system makes this guy to behave this way? And how we can change the system? And a very good way to do it is uh, casual uh, loop diagramming, basically when you look a be between the different part of the system and what is causing what. So we have a we have a nice conversation here about okay people who don't want to don't want to learn or people we don't have a time for learning something like that. So so we get a conversation about how we can solve the problem, how we can change the system to solve the problem. Because often we have a situation like, how are we doing with the time? Uh, good enough. We have a situation like, oh, we want to do more TDD. That's OK. So you hear all the time, we need to do the tes unit testing. And now we have a situation, so why you don't do the TDD? Oh, we have a tight schedule in this project. But the next project, we're going to do the TDD. And you have a next project. Oh, we're going to do the next project, because now we have a tight schedule, right? Just because you run the project this way, and the goal for the project manager is to deliver by the date. So the project manager do not worry so much about the quality as about the deadline. The deadline is more important than the quality for the most of the project manager. And again, it's not about the project managers, so this is not their fault. It's about the system we have created around them. So if we move to the product development from project management, so we think about the product, then the product owner says, OK, I'm going to maintain the system for 10 years, so if I don't invest in the unit testing right now, I'm not going to add any feature two years from now. So I need to remember about this one, because my perspective is the two years. But again, we can go to the PMO and say, OK, guys, you need to do the TDD, and say, yeah, we need to do the TDD. That's a great idea. Let's find a project. And there is no project for doing a TDD, by the way. So if you have a, this kind of situation, again, this is a system you have. It's not about the people they don't want to. They really want to, just not on the project. Uh, next very amazing thing you can do is just visualize, uh, visualize the problems. <laughs> so one of the biggest weapon that the Scrum Master has is a transparency of the visualization. What you do, basically, you show the problem to the organization. You show it painfully, so the organization says, OK, we have a problem. Oh, we have a problem. Oh, we have a problem. And the moment you start showing this problem, you either get fired, that's one option, or the second option is someone will take care of the problem, because a lot of people are not aware of the problem. The, the fact that you are aware of the problem doesn't mean that anyone else. So as a Scrum Master or Agile Coach, you are supposed to show the problem to the organization in any way. Sometimes it can, can, be, can be painful, sometimes it can be less painful. So for example, if we have a lot of bugs, oops, that's an that's, that's uh, OK. So coming, uh, just an example from the Toyota, uh, when they have a when they have a system showing where the stance should be. So it's again, it's a visualization. And if something is missing here, then most likely someone took away this stuff and put it somewhere else. So we need to find, find where it is. Uh, and in our system, we can show, for example, how we're doing with the work, right? Kind of, kind of cool tool, task board. Uh, we can show the bugs. We can show the new requests. You can show anything that is important for showing in our organization. And by the way, this is the reason why we put the task board on the wall, not into the tool. Because in most of the tools, the visualization just sucks right now. Because most of the people do not open their tool when they come out to the office. They, and if you have a task board on the wall when the moment you come into the office, everybody just see it. And they see that there is some problem. 
mentioned it already, empowering people, right? So the people can then do the decision so they can improve the system. And Toyota takes it very, very seriously. What they do, for example, in a uh, factory in the US, in Kentucky, they get uh, 80,000 suggestions for the improvement during the year. It's not done by engineers, it's done by the local workers, line workers, who are there and who are looking to how we, I can improve the way I work right now. So 80,000 improvements during the year by the line people. And most of them, like 99% of them, are being implemented. So one thing is, make sure that the people has ideas. Second, make sure that those ideas are being implemented. Because if you ask uh, people for ideas, and then it's take you two years to implement those ideas, then just, they will just give up. So again, we're not working mostly with the line workers, the guy who used to be a, you know, a, a, a someone very, very simple, basic education. We mostly work with the engineers. And telling the engineers how to work Basically, it's not a good way. So what you can do is make sure that the people closer to the problem can, f can fix the problem, can solve the problem, OK? Make sure that you don't ask them to come up to your, to m with the question or with the, with the decision to you, right? Make sure that they can solve all the problems themselves. OK, we have a few minutes left. So a uh, very quick picture or what, what you can, where you can learn a little more about it. So there's a huge amount of books. Uh, you can hear about the lean and how, we do, how can we move it from the, so from the Toyota production to the software development. Uh, one of the greatest one is Mary Popendix. She's at the top here. So any book from Mary and Tom Papendix is just a basic introduction. The other area I would l recommend you to look at is uh, Mr. Licker, Toyota Way. It's uh, basically how the Toyota run the system. And by the way, Toyota was extremely open to showing the system to one, anyone interested. And when some, some of the junior uh, engineers ask, why are we showing our system to those guys? He's, he heard, well, we're continuously improving. The moment that they get as good as we do, we should be better. So we don't need to worry about them copying our system because we are supposed to be better a few years from now. Uh, OK. So the bottom line, and we're done. Uh, three things you need to do when you're com coming back Monday to your office. Find the biggest waste, identify what is the biggest problem you have right now, fix it, <laughs> and repeat. <laughs> and I spent uh, the whole presentation talking mostly about the process, about the system. One thing you need to remember there are people in the system, and the people are always more important, and the interaction are always more important than any system you will create. So don't focus just on the process. Don't focus just on the system. Make sure that you remember the people. Spasiba. Спасибо большое за доклад. Теперь у нас вопросы. Встаем, руку поднимаем, встаем, задаем вопрос. You guys can ask a question in Russian if you want, and someone will translate. And hopefully, I get the same question as you ask it. No, it's not English. Okay. Maybe, maybe you will tell this in Russian or whatever. <laughs>